Discover Geography, Lesson 6-4, Resources. Economic development is heavily dependent on access to resources, sinks, and services from the natural environment. A resource is something that can be withdrawn from the environment for human use. So you see in the picture an example of oil as a natural resource. We can drill for oil, take it, and use it for a variety of purposes. A sink is the capacity of the environment to absorb our waste. So we take in resources, we do stuff with them, and then we generate waste that has to be absorbed by the natural environment. So in this picture you see a smokestack letting off some smoke. If the atmosphere is able to absorb that smoke without any detrimental effects, we would say that the sink for that smoke is not yet filled. Finally, services are things that the environment can do for us without necessarily being used up. So a classic example of an environmental service is filtration of water through wetlands. We know now that wetlands are extremely important because as water flows through them, it's cleaned and storm surges are evened out as they're absorbed by the wetlands. So this is something that the wetlands are doing for us, something useful that we get as a result of their existence, but we're not using up the wetlands. We're not taking them away in the way we would with a resource, and we're not putting stuff into them that's going to fill them up in the way that we would with a sink. For this lesson, we're going to be focusing mostly on resources, but much of what we have to say about resources can be applied to sinks and services as well. One of the key issues about resources is the question of whether they're renewable or non-renewable. A renewable resource is one that comes back after we use it, that replenishes itself. A non-renewable resource is one for which there's a fixed amount available, and any use of it is going to draw it down permanently. Now, renewable versus non-renewable is not a simple divide. We actually have resources at varying degrees of renewability. So what you see on this diagram here, at the upper left, we have solar power. Solar power is an entirely renewable resource. It doesn't matter how much solar energy we generate today, there will be more energy coming down from the sun tomorrow. The sunlight will always replenish itself no matter what we do. The next step on this diagram shows some timber. Timber is a mostly renewable resource. It's a resource that will renew itself given enough time and space. So we can cut down a bunch of trees now. If we leave them for long enough, trees can grow back, and so we'll have more timber. So if we harvest them at a sustainable rate, then we can continue to have timber indefinitely. So it will renew itself given enough time. The next picture you see is a picture of a well pumping some water from an underground aquifer. Aquifers, likewise, are typically renewable, but on a much longer time scale than something like timber. Trees can grow to a useful height in a decade or two, depending on the species. Aquifers often recharge over a much longer time period than that. So the time scale of human withdrawal from those aquifers may be much greater than the amount of recharge that might go on during that same period of time. So while that resource is renewable in the very long term, if we were to leave that aquifer for thousands of years, it would refill from any withdrawal we make from it. In the shorter term that we're interested in for our own lifetimes, for our own economic activities, we can treat that aquifer as basically non-renewable. It's not going to recharge fast enough to do us any good for the amount of water that we might want to withdraw from it. And then finally, in the lower right, you see a gold mine. Gold is an entirely non-renewable resource on the Earth. Nothing is going to make more gold on the Earth. There's a fixed amount of it in the Earth's crust that can ever be extracted. Changing economic situations might make certain gold deposits more economical to exploit in some situations or make them uneconomical to bother exploiting in other situations. So the effective amount of gold available may change over time. But the amount of gold that we mine is always going to be taken away from the total that's theoretically available to us. Renewability and non-renewability determine the best way to use these resources over the long period of time. With a renewable resource, our goal is to have a sustainable use of that resource, to be able to continue using that resource at the same rate indefinitely into the future. 
And the basic principle for how to do this is to only withdraw from that resource as much as comes back within that same time period. Only cut down as many trees as will regrow during that time period. Only catch as many fish as will be born to replace them in that time period. In economic terms, this is like living off the interest without touching the principal on an investment. So that principal, the initial investment of money, will generate a certain amount of interest each year. If you withdraw that interest but leave the principal untouched, then next year that, that principal will generate the same amount of interest. You can withdraw that again. The next year it will generate that same amount of interest. You can withdraw that again. You can keep withdrawing that interest indefinitely. However, if you start to cut into the principal, if you start withdrawing more money than you earned in interest that year, then the next year there will be less money in the account and therefore less interest generated. And so if you continue to cut into the principal every time you withdraw from that investment, eventually you're going to run out of money entirely. And that's roughly what would happen with unsustainable use of a renewable resource. If we're withdrawing more than will be replenished during that same time period, we're eventually going to run out. With a non-renewable resource, we can't apply the same philosophy. If we only withdraw a non-renewable resource at the same rate that it's replenished, we're not going to withdraw it at all. We wouldn't be able to use a non-renewable resource at all if we could only use it at the rate which it replenished itself. There's no more gold that's going to be created within the surface of the earth, and so therefore that only withdraw the amount it's replenished philosophy would say, never mind for any gold. But then that would mean we have a resource that's potentially useful that we're just leaving there and not using. So the alternative principle that applies to non-renewable resource use is that we should use the non-renewable resource in such a way as to allow us to replace it with something else when it runs out. A good example of this comes from energy development. Much of our energy today is based on withdrawing resources that are effectively non-renewable. We're not creating new coal or oil or natural gas on our world on any sort of scale that would be of any use to us. They were formed over the course of millions upon millions of years. So they're effectively non-renewable resources for us. We are able to withdraw those resources, dig them up or drill them, and use them Using those resources has allowed us to develop an industrial society. And that industrial society has allowed us to create renewable sources of energy, like solar power, for example. Our society could not have gone directly from an agrarian pre-industrial society to a solar-powered society. We would not have been able to manufacture the solar panels to power industry if we tried to move immediately to use of solar energy when we began to industrialize. On the other hand, we could begin using coal and oil right off the bat. So if our society uses up coal and oil in such a way as to generate the industrial capacity that allows us to manufacture solar panels as well as things like wind turbines and other renewable energy sources on a large enough scale to replace what we used to get in energy from the fossil fuels, that will be a reasonable use of a non-renewable resource. We used it in such a way that allowed us to replace it with something else once it got used up. Now all of this assumes that we know how much of the resource there is, how quickly we're using it up, etc. But often there's a great deal of uncertainty attached to resource use. We don't know exactly how the natural environment is going to respond to our activities. So to deal with this uncertainty, we can invoke something called the precautionary principle. There are many different specific statements of the precautionary principle. What you see on the slide is one famous way of putting it from an event called the Wingspread Conference. And they said the precautionary principle states that when an activity raises threats of harm to human health or the environment, Precautionary measures should be taken even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established scientifically. So if we apply this to the case of use of a renewable resource, 
we may have a situation in which we aren't exactly sure how much withdrawal of that resource is sustainable. How much is that resource going to be able to replenish itself? The precautionary principle says to err on the side of not damaging the natural environment. In this case, to err on the side of withdrawing less from that resource, just in case. So we don't have to have proof that a certain level of resource withdrawal is definitely going to be bad, is definitely going to be unsustainable. If we think there's a plausible reason to worry about that, we can take precautionary measures. We can hold back just in case, because if we get this wrong, if we over withdraw this resource and we ruin our resource base, we can't fix that. If we get it wrong in the other direction, if we hold off on using that resource, even though we actually could have gotten away with using it more, then in the long run, all we've done is we've taken a pass on an opportunity that might have been there. And so if in the future we figure out our mistake, we can increase our resource use without much trouble. So the precautionary principle aims to help us deal with situations where there's uncertainty, where we don't actually know exactly how much use our resources can sustain. The Aral Sea in Central Asia provides a good case study for some of these issues in showing the negative consequences of unsustainable resource use. Prior to the industrialization of the Soviet Union, which controlled this area up until 1991, the Aral Sea was the fourth largest inland body of water in the world. It was fed by two rivers, the Sir Darya and Amu Darya, that flowed down out of the mountains along the border between China and the Soviet Union across a largely desert landscape into the Aral Sea. So these two rivers were essential sources of water for anyone living in Central Asia. In the Soviet system, Central Asia became the primary source of cotton. As a result of this agriculture of cotton, the Aral Sea has now been drying up. You can see in these satellite photos how much the Aral Sea has shrunk over the course of several decades of cotton development in the countries around the Aral Sea. Here you see a cotton farm in the country of Uzbekistan. In order to grow this cotton in a largely desert environment, the water from the Amu Darya and Sir Darya rivers had to be diverted into the fields. Cotton is a very thirsty crop, so it benefited from all of the sunshine in Central Asia, but it also required a large amount of water. By diverting all of that water from the rivers, Soviet Union reduced the flow into the Aral Sea. This resulted in the drying up of large areas of the Aral Sea. All around where the coast of the Aral Sea used to be, you see boats like this stranded as the waters disappeared. And now they just sit in the middle of a desert. So this diversion of water into the cotton fields was a major disaster for the Aral Sea itself. It was also a major disaster for the cotton fields. Underneath the ground in Central Asia, like in many desert parts of the world, is a saline aquifer. That is, groundwater that has lots of salt in it. And salt is not good for growing plants. If plants get their roots into salty water, they're going to suffer. The saline aquifer had been low enough down, had been deep enough under the ground not to affect agriculture in Central Asia for centuries. But with the expansion of cotton agriculture under the Soviet Union, we saw increased application of water to the fields. Huge amounts of water diverted from these rivers and dumped on the fields to irrigate these plants. Some of that water was taken up by the plants in their roots and benefited their growth. But other water trickled down through the soil into the aquifer and began to raise the water level. As the water level rose, it brought that salt up with it. Eventually, that salt started to come into contact with the roots of the cotton crops. So we now see large areas of Central Asia experiencing problems of salinization, of salty soil as a result of over-irrigation. You can see that reflected in cotton yield numbers in Uzbekistan. You can see here that cotton yields have declined over the course of the last few decades. Even after the fall of the Soviet Union, Uzbekistan maintained a heavily cotton-dependent economy. They continued to heavily irrigate these fields in order to produce cotton, which was their main export crop. But because of salinization, their ability to grow cotton on a large scale has been hurt. 
their soil can no longer support as much cotton growth. And this is a major economic crisis for the countries around the Aral Sea now, that their misuse of the water resource is now undermining their economic base. Currently, there is a program in place to try to save at least the northern bit of the Aral Sea. This part of the Aral Sea lies within the country of Kazakhstan and is fed by the Sir Darya River, which was not as heavily overused as the Amu Darya, which feeds into the southern part of the Aral Sea, or which did feed into the southern part of the Aral Sea until a few decades ago when the entirety of its water began to be used by agriculture in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. In the northern Aral Sea, there's still some input of water from the Sir Darya River. And so Kazakhstan built a dam to block the North Aral Sea off from the South Aral Sea and allow the North Aral Sea to partially refill. So the North Aral Sea's water levels are currently stabilized. It's smaller than it was in the past. It's no longer connected to the South Aral Sea, but it is stabilized. It's no longer shrinking. So the Northern Aral Sea has stabilized this crisis while the problems in the Southern Aral Sea and the countries connected to it remain as a result of unwise, improper resource use.